You know, Mr. President, with all that's happened in the last couple of weeks, I feel like we are at one of those historical moments where future generations will look back and they'll decide who we were. Are you the president to unite all of us, given everything that's happening right now? Well, I certainly think so, and I certainly hope so. And uh, the relationships we have are incredible. The spirit of this country, and especially considering what happened. I mean, we had out of nowhere a plague come in from China. It just came in, and it came to all over the world. It went all over the world. You look at 186 countries, and they were devastated. And we were certainly hit very hard. Some were hit harder than us, relatively, but we were hit very, very hard. And now we're making our comeback. And then on top of it, we had the, uh, the riots, which were unnecessary to the extent they were. If the governors and mayors would have taken a stronger action, I think the riots would have been, you could call them protesters, you could call them riots. They were different nights, different things. In Minneapolis, uh, they went numerous nights. And then I said, you got to get the guard in there. We got the guard in there and it all stopped. They could have done that earlier. Now you look at what's going on in, uh, I mean, you could look at a couple of places that are so in such great shape, but then you look at Seattle, look at that. What's that all about? How do they allow that to happen? That's just a bad philosophy. So uh, I think it's incredible where we are and what we've done considering where we came from. We were riding high. We had the greatest economy in history. We had the greatest employment numbers in history, including Black, African-American, if you look at the African-American numbers, were incredible, the best they've ever been. Spanish, if you look at Hispanic and Asian numbers, women numbers, everybody. And then we got hit with this plague, this horrible plague, and it was devastating from many ways, including the lives that were lost. That can never be regained. The economics, we're going to gain economically, we're going to be great. Next year, we're going to have a fantastic year. I think we're going to have a fantastic third quarter. But uh, you can never replace the lives. I, I want to talk with you about where we are just in terms of the black community, people of color. Yeah. You know, I, I hear you use the word rioter, and, and I understand. We, we covered it on Fox News. I covered much of that at night as it was bursting a couple of Saturday nights ago. Right. Um, the looting. And it was heartbreaking to see businesses, small businesses, which we know employ north of 66 percent of, of people in America. Yeah, it was. At the same time, you had peaceful protesters, yeah, and they were true. hurting. And I know from your team, you watched that eight minutes and 46 seconds of George Floyd. And Mr. President, your response to that is different than a person of color. And I'm a mom. When he called out mom on that tape, yeah. it's a heart punch. So. I'm curious from you, what do you think the protesters, not, not the looters and the rioters, we, we're, we're intelligent enough to know the difference in yeah, our country, sure. right? What do you think they want? What do you think they need right now from you? So I think you had protesters for different reasons, and then you had protesting also because, you know, they just didn't know. I, I've watched. I watched it very closely. Why are you here? And they really weren't able to say, but they were there for a reason, perhaps, but uh, a lot of them really were there because they're following the crowd. A lot of them there were there because what we witnessed was a terrible thing. What we saw was a terrible thing. And we've seen it over the years. We haven't, you know, this was one horrible example, but you've seen other terrible yeah. examples. You know that better than anybody would, would know it. And uh, and I know it. I've seen it, too. I've seen it before I was president. What do and you say During that? the presidency, I've seen it. Uh, I think it's a shame. I think it's a disgrace. And it's got to stop. At the same time, you also know that we have incredible people in law enforcement and we have to cherish them and take care of them. And we can't let something like this where you have a bad apple go out and, you know, destroy the image of a whole of, of millions of people that take really good care of us. And then you have a movement where they say, let's not have a police department. And you say, where are these people coming from? All right. So do you think you're perhaps closer than the nation might have ever been? right now with police reform. You've got both sides talking. You've got the third most powerful person in the House, James Clyburn, saying no to defunding police. We need reform. What are you in favor well, that's of? that's a big step when he says no, because everyone understands that. And I don't yeah. know, is that just a phrase to break things up? No, because he Where was talking about coming? some of the things that would be in a bipartisan bill. I mean, I can't put words in his mouth. I can yeah. only tell you no, what I'm not saying. talking about him. I'm saying when they talk about 
police, when they actually talk about beyond uh, defunding, they actually go all out. Because defunding to a lot of people means break up the police forces and Either that or don't give them any money. So, so essentially what do you they're see? breaking it up. Like what is I want to see I want to see really compassionate but strong law enforcement, police force, but law enforcement. Say no. And to I don't want to see mistakes. Yeah. I I don't like jail calls. Now I will say this. As somebody that, you know, you grow up and you wrestle and you fight and you this or you see what happens. Um, sometimes if you're alone and you're fighting somebody's tough. And you get somebody in a chokehold, what are you going to do? Say, oh, and it's a real bad person. And you know that. And they do exist. I mean, we have some real bad people. You saw that during the last uh, couple of weeks. You saw some very good people protesting. You saw some bad people also. And you get somebody in a chokehold. And what are you going to do now? Let go and say, oh, let's start all over again. I'm not allowed to have you in a chokehold. It's a tough situation. Now, if you have two people or and the case four. and the case that we're talking about, right. you had four, four people. Yeah. And two of them, I guess, just pretty much started. So it's a very, very, a very tricky situation. But, that's an so the chokehold point. thing is is good because to talk about because mm -hmm. off the cuff it would sound like absolutely, but if you're thinking about it, then you realize maybe there is a bad fight, and the officer gets somebody in a position that's so you a very say tough it's position. A sliding scale depending on what the circumstances. I are. I think you have to probably say. Do you want to be in that conversation? Are you in that conversation? I right really now? am. And I think the concept of choke hold sounds so innocent, so perfect. And then you realize if it's a one on one, now if it's two on one, that's a little bit of a different story, depending. Mm -hmm. Depending on the toughness and strength. You know, we're talking about toughness and strength. We are talking, there's a physical thing here also. But if a police officer is in a bad scuffle and he's Got somebody. Well, in a if it's a one on one fight for the life. Yeah, and that's that does happen. Saying. And that does happen. But too. In terms so you have of to be careful. With that being said, it would be, I think, a very good thing that, generally speaking, it should be ended. That's interesting. Do you want that to be a top down federal or should it be at the local level? Well, it could that's be at local the question level. right now yeah, is, it is could Congress be at local goes level. back and forth too. It could be local level, and in some cases it will be local level, but I think we can certainly make recommendations and they could be very strong recommendations. You look at me and, and I'm Harris on TV, but I'm a black woman. Yeah. I'm a mom. And, you know, when, and you've talked about it, but we haven't seen you come out and be that consoler in this instance. And the tweets. When the looting starts, the shooting starts. Why those words? So that's a, an expression I've heard over the years. And it Do you know really where it comes from? To, uh, I think Philadelphia, the mayor of Philadelphia. No, from what it, it comes from 1967. I was about 18 months old at the time. Everybody's shooting wiki because they probably got it wrong. But it was from the chief of police in Miami. He was cracking down and he meant what he said. And he said, I don't even care if it makes it look like brutality, I'm gonna crack down when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Yeah. Um, that frightened a lot of people when you, you tweeted that. Well, it that. also comes from a very tough mayor who I might've been police commissioner at the time, but I think mayor of Philadelphia named Frank Rizzo. And he had an expression like that. But I've heard it many times from, I think it's been used many times. Uh, it means two things, uh, very different things. One is if there's looting, there's probably going to be shooting. And that's not as a threat. That's really just a fact because that's what happens. And the other is if there's looting, there's going to be shooting. There's a very, they're very different meanings. Oh, interesting. No, there's very different meanings. But I think. Do you that, think most people see it that way? I think they see it both ways. No, I mean, I've, I've had it viewed both ways. I think it's meant both ways, not by the same person. But when the looting starts, it oftentimes means there's going to be shooting, there's going to be death, there's going to be killing, and it's a bad thing. And it's also used as a threat. It's used both ways. But if you think about it, look at what happened, how people were devastated with the looting. Look at what happened. Your rally in Oklahoma is set for June 19th. Was that on purpose? Uh, no, but I know exactly what you're going to say. Well, and I'm just asking. It, I've not got anything to say. Think about it as a celebration. My rally is a celebration. We're going to Oklahoma. And if you think about it relative to your question, think about it as a celebration. Don't think about it as an inconvenience. Think about this as a celebration. Oh, no, no, no. This it's, will be. It's on the day of African American emancipation. It's, that's right. It's and the Independence Day. The fact that I'm having a rally 
on that day, you can really think about that very positively as a celebration, because a rally to me is a celebration. It's going to be really a celebration, and it's an interesting date. It wasn't done for that reason, but it's an interesting date, but it's a celebration. Talk to me about police reform. You call yourself the law and order president. What does that mean? Well, we are going to do lots of, I think, good things, but we also have to keep our police and our law enforcement strong. They have to do it right. They have to be trained in a proper manner. They have to do it right. Again, the, the sad thing is that they are very professional, but when you see an event like that with the more than eight minutes of uh, horror, that's eight min minutes really of horror, it's a disgrace. Uh, and then people start saying, well, are all police like that? They don't know. Maybe they don't think about it that much. It doesn't make any difference. The fact is they start saying, well, police are like that. People, police aren't like that. Can the law and order president also be the consoler in chief? Yes, I think so. I think the law and order president can keep a situation like Seattle from ever happening. It should never happen. What happened in Seattle? What happened in Minneapolis should never happen. You had some harsh words to say about Seattle's mayor. Why? Because I saw her break down. I saw her leave. I saw her have absolutely no control. And I saw her make a lot of bad decisions, including don't do anything that's going to affect anybody. Toughness sometimes is the most compassionate because people are getting badly hurt. Look at what happened in Minneapolis where they left the precinct, the, the, the city, which is can, a great place. About, I've been there many times. It's a great place. The black police being, officer who was yeah, killed? But by being compassionate, by being compassionate, she thought she was being compassionate. Or in the case of, in the case of Minneapolis, the young gentleman, the mayor, thought he was mayor being Fry. compassionate. I mean, what was that all about? And look at the damage and the the travesty and the small businesses and the death. Look at what happened. So by being soft and weak, you end up not being compassionate. It ends up being a very dangerous situation. I want to talk with you about revitalization in black communities, the focus of the opportunity zones right. that you put into place. I think it was late 2017. Right. Tim Scott, how, how great, does, great senator. senator Tim Scott, how does all of that fit into talking with the protesters and and people right now wanting for the black community and and not just blacks but communities of color people who are disadvantaged yeah. in general i mean the economy is the great unifier so, right i think i've done more for the black community than any other president and let's take a pass on abraham lincoln because he did Good, although it's always questionable. You know, in other words, the end result. Well, we are free, Mr. President. But you, we are you did free. pretty well. You understand what I mean. <laughs> yeah, no, so I'm going to take a pass on a, a honest Abe, as we call it. But him. you say you've done more than well, anybody. Well, look, criminal justice reform. Nobody else could have done it. I did it. Uh, I didn't get a lot of notoriety. And the fact the people I did it for then go on television and thank everybody but me. And they needed me to get it done. And I got it done. And I got five or six Republican senators who had no interest in getting it done, and they were great, and we got it done. Uh, we did that. The historically black colleges and universities were not funded. They weren't funded. I got them funded on a long-term basis and took care of them. I became friendly every year for three years. I, you know the story. They, they were the heads, the deans, the heads, the presidents of the universities and colleges would come up. I got to know them. 44 or so people would come up to the Oval Office. First year was normal. I said, all right, let's do it. Second year, I said, why are you back again, don't they? Third year, I said, why are you here? They said, because for many years, we've had to come back here every single year. One of them, great people, he said, we have to beg for money. I said, you shouldn't be begging. You should be back at your colleges or universities, and you should be teaching and doing the job. I got them long-term money, more than they had, much more than they had, and I got it permanent. They don't have to come back into Washington, D.C. I said, the only bad part is I won't see you again, maybe. It was true. <laughs> I saw them every, like 44 guys. They were great people. But I took care of that. Opportunity zones, I did that. Prison reform. Were those hit I mean, in some more, of the rioting? Yeah, the looting, by the way, those, Harris, honestly, I've those done cities, more, those I've, opportunity zones? Uh, the opportunity zones are where vast amounts of money are going into areas that never got money. They're investing. 
the people that put the money have tax advantages or they get certain advantages, otherwise they're not going to put up their money. And it affects tremendously the employment in areas that were absolutely dead or dying. So and they should bounce thing. back faster. They are. Well, we, either they, from the pandemic or from this latest round of destruction. You know they were bouncing back really well, and then we got the plague, okay? But they'll be. And we'll get this straightened out with what this is now. You can never lose, we can never gain back all of those lives that were lost. Outside of that, we're going to be in very, very strong shape. You know, we have tremendous stimulus. We have a lot of things happening. I was going to toggle right then to former commander uh, in Louisville, I believe, Dorn, David Dorn. Yes. Who's, I called his wife last night. You talked with Anne Marie. Yes. Um, you know, it didn't get a lot of coverage. We talked about it on, on both my shows on Fox, but his murder was streamed live on Facebook, African-American cop. Um, these have been a really tough couple of weeks, and you have lost people of color on both sides of what I guess would be termed as a fight, although I think we're all in this together, and we've got to get to a better place. But with Chief Dorn, so I spoke to his wife. She was devastated. She sounded just like a great woman. But did you see all the people that went to that funeral? It was incredible. So the people get it. But whatever it is, you'll have to explain this one to me, it wasn't covered. This was an African-American top guy, many years on the force. Killed by looters, streamed live Killed by on looters. Facebook. Yeah. And he wasn't being aggressive either. He was just- He, he was, was defending very, his friend's He was a shot. very professional guy and he was killed. And why didn't that get any airtime? And yet the people got it because when you looked at what, I don't know if you got to see that, the lines, oh, yeah. the, the visitation lines on one day and then the funeral the, the next, absolutely. They were around the block. It was a 6, beautiful thing to people. say. But uh, no, he was a great gentleman. I just say this, if there were more toughness, you wouldn't have the kind of devastation that you had in Minneapolis and in Seattle. I mean, let's see what's going on in Seattle. But I will tell you, if they don't straighten that situation out, we're going to straighten it out. And what do you mean by that? Like, what? I don't know if you caught it, but Governor Cuomo was so upset with Mayor de Blasio of New York, he said, I'm going to displace him. I, I don't really know how that would work. But I mean, is that what you mean in Seattle? What I mean is very simple. We're not going to let Seattle be occupied by anarchists. And I'm not calling them Have you protesters. Talked to the mayor? I'm not costing, no, I, but I got to see a performance that I've never seen. I mean, you think he was a weak person in Minneapolis. The woman, I don't know, has she ever done this before? How can you- In Seattle. Oh, it's pathetic. No, no, we're not gonna let this happen in Seattle. If we have to go in, we're gonna go in. The governor's either gonna do it, let the governor do it. He's got great National Guard troops, He'll, he can do it. But one way or the other, it's gonna get done. These people are not gonna occupy a major portion of a great city. They're not going to do it. And they can solve that problem very easily. General Milley, Joint Chiefs of Staff, I don't know how much you knew that he was going to say today before he spoke, but he says he regrets having been there. He apologized having been there on the Lafayette Square with you for the picture, the, the infamous picture as you walked to the church and held the Bible. I think it was a beautiful picture. Why do you? And I'll tell you, think I think Christians think it was a beautiful picture. But why do you think you're hearing from General Milley, from Secretary of Defense Esper, and not why you think you are, but do you think it's significant? No, I don't think so. No, I mean, I, if that's the way they feel, I think that's fine. Um, I have good relationships with the military. I've rebuilt our military. I spent two and a half trillion dollars, nobody else did, when we took it over from President Obama and Biden. The military was a joke. The military was depleted. I have one last question. It has to do with Joe Biden. Did you hear what he said today? No, I didn't. Okay. He said that he believes that you will steal the election. And if you don't win, he thinks that military will escort you from the White House. Look, Joe's not all there. Everybody knows it. And it's sad when you look at it and you see it. You see it for yourself. He's created his own sanctuary city in the basement of wherever he is. And he doesn't come out. And certainly if I don't win, I don't win. I mean, you know, I go on and do other things. I think it would be a very sad thing for our country.